It was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that, uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. Today we delve into the enigmatic and chilling final chapter of Ted Bundy's story, his last interview with James Dobson. Hours before his execution, Bundy engages in a psychological chess game, using his intelligence and charm in a desperate bid to avoid the chair for the multitude of horrendous murders he committed. Before we delve into today's topic, please be aware that this video discusses sensitive and potentially disturbing content related to violent crimes. Viewer discretion is advised. As we explore this chilling interview, consider what signs of manipulation you notice in Bundy's responses. Share your thoughts in the comments below. Ted, it is uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon. You are scheduled to be executed tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock if you don't receive another stay. What is going through your mind? What thoughts have you had in these last few days? Well, I won't kid you to say that it's something that I feel that I am in control of or something that I've come to terms with because I haven't. It's a moment by moment thing. Uh, sometimes I feel very tranquil and other times uh, I don't feel tranquil at all. Um, what's going through my mind right now is to use the minutes and hours that I have left as fruitfully as possible and see what happens. Uh, it helps to, to live in the moment in the, in the essence that we use it productively. So I'm, right now I'm feeling calm and it, it, in large part because I'm here with you. Bundy talks about using his time productively, which seems honest, but there's more to it. He claims he's a victim of intimate imagery, leading him down a dark path. This narrative makes him seem less like a perpetrator and more like someone who also suffered. It's a clever move, especially when he's trying to align with Dobson's views against pornography. Does he need to be incarcerated? Yes, but he doesn't deserve execution. For years, he had denied committing the murders. Now, as part of his last gamble, he admits the murders, but denies full responsibility for them, seeking an ally in James Dobson, who may intercede in his pleas for clemency and the commutation of his death sentence. Psychopaths will frequently try to use flattery to create a good... People much more intelligent than I have been working on for, uh, for years, but one that I've been working on for years and trying to understand it is there enough time to explain it all? Uh, I don't know. I think I understand it, though. Understand what happened to me uh, to the extent that I, I, I can see how certain feelings and ideas uh, developed in me to the point where I began to act out on them. Certain very violent and very destructive feelings. As a psychiatrist watching this, several things stick out. Firstly, Bundy's acknowledgement of his crimes is unaccompanied by any significant overt emotional response, suggesting a lack of empathy and remorse, key elements of psychopathy. Secondly, his reflection on the development of his violent tendencies is designed to point to self-awareness, but is belied by the detachment in his tone. This is indicative of the emotional shallowness we see in psychopaths. Lastly, it is very striking to me that Bundy asks, yeah. Is there enough time to explain it all? Uh, I don't know. Is there enough time to explain it all? This could be seen as either a throwaway comment or reflection on the lack of time he has to help others by explaining what he thinks happened to him. Given Bundy's psychopathy score, I think it is far more likely that this is him trying to plant the seed, that if he only had more time, he could productively help society by helping it understand the suggested link between intimate imagery and the development of serial killers. Again, he is fishing for a commutation of his death sentence, but he is doing so quite subtly and in quite a superficially charming and believable manner. He's quite good at playing the part. I'll give him that. Let, let's go back then to those roots. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you consider to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused. You were not sexually abused. You were not emotionally abused. No, in no way. I, and that's... Part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because uh, I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents, uh, one of uh, five brothers and sisters, a home 
where we as, our, as children were the focus of, of my parents' lives, where we regularly attended church, uh, two Christian parents who did not drink, they did not smoke, there was no gambling, there was no physical abuse or fighting in the home. I'm not saying this was leave it the beaver. It wasn't a perfect. Home. Well, no, I don't know that such a home exists, but it was a fine, solid Christian home. Bundy's emphasis on a wholesome upbringing serves to dissociate his psychopathic behavior from environmental factors. This contradicts reports of a troubled early life, suggesting an intentional narrative to absolve himself from blame and reinforce his victimhood stance. His mother reports he lived with his maternal grandfather, a man who was known to do terrible things to his children, spout racist rhetoric, and kill neighborhood pets, and who is suspected of fathering Bundy with his own daughter as well. Additionally, Bundy was shoplifting, stealing and engaging in peeping Tom behaviors from a relatively early age, and was even suspected of committing his first murder at the age of 15, when Anne-Marie Burr, an eight-year-old, disappeared. In 1987, Bundy confided that he would never talk about some murders because they were committed too close to home, too close to family, or involved, victims who were very young. I suspect we can believe Bundy when he said this, and believe that there were more victims and some were not yet adults. And nobody, uh, I hope no one will try to take the easy way out, and to try to blame or otherwise accuse my, uh, my family of contributing to this, because uh, I know, and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how, what happened, and I think this is a message I want to get across. But as a young, uh, a young boy, and I mean the boy of well, 12 or 13, certainly, uh, that I encountered outside the home again, uh, yeah. in um, the local grocery store, or the local uh, uh, drugstore, the softcore pornography, what people call softcore. Uh, but dwelling on the issues with his upbringing wouldn't further Bundy's goal of putting all the blame on his exposure to intimate imagery. Bundy's continued insistence on intimate imagery shaping his actions is a classic psychopathic trait of externalizing blame. His ability to present this narrative in a charming, convincing manner highlights his manipulative skills, even in the face of overwhelming evidence of his intrinsic violent tendencies. He's a monster but he's a very capable, intelligent, superficially charming, and superficially believable monster. That was why he was so dangerous. But as I think I, I explained to you last night, Dr. Dobson, in an anecdote, that as young boys do, we explored the, the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood, and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house, and from time to time we'd come across, so pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic, you might say, more explicit nature than we would encounter, let's say, in your local grocery store. And this also included such things as, let's say, detective magazines and uh, more hard Those that involved porn. violence. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, I, I, and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the, 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 the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography. And my, again, I'm talking from personal experience. Uh, hard, real, personal experience. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, mm -hmm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Again, Bundy emphasizes the influence of intimate imagery in his developmental years. He links the combination of violence and sexual content in intimate imagery as catalytic in his development of violent behavior. This aligns with his continued narrative that external factors created this sickness in him, which he isn't responsible for. He's the real victim here. By verbally claiming responsibility while shifting the blame to external factors, he follows a common tactic used in manipulative behaviors, aligning with characteristics of the hair psychopathy checklist. He's quite charming and outwardly believable and earnest when doing this, though. You can easily see how he'd have been able to put people at ease and get close enough to attack. Now, walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think you know, it's important to me and uh, uh, that, people, that people believe what I'm saying, to tell you that 
that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things, that I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done, that, that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things, that I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done. I often see this. Psychopaths and other manipulators say they are doing the precise opposite of what they're doing, as though saying it will cause one to miss what they're doing. Yes, he is blaming pornography, and no, he isn't taking full responsibility for what he's done. This contradiction is typical of psychopathic behavior, where individuals often engage in manipulative tactics to appear responsible while pointing the finger elsewhere. What's your take on Bundy blaming intimate imagery? Is it a deflection of guilt or could there be some truth to his claims? That's not the question here. The question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior. It fueled your fantasy, Stephen. Well, in, in the beginning it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, make it in, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of. Things. Here, Bundy again plays a double game. He admits he's not a helpless victim, yet he keeps emphasizing how external influences shaped his actions. It's a strategic way to admit some fault while still shifting the real blame. This approach is common in individuals trying to negotiate their way out of a tight spot, especially when they've been caught. Bundy does throughout the entire interview, and once you're aware of it, it jumps out at you. Now, I really want to understand that. You had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material, and you made or printed and video or film Phone, or film, photos, magazines, yeah. what have you. And, and then there was the urge to take that little step, or big step, over to a physical right. uh, event. And it happens, it, it happened in stages, gradually. It doesn't necessarily, not to me at least, happen overnight. My experience with, I say pornography generally, but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality, um, is that once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, yeah. more it's graphic more kinds of material. Mm -hmm. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which, which gives you a greater uh, sense of, 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 of uh, excitement. Until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far, you reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading about it or looking at it. Bundy's description of his escalating need for more explicit material mirrors the pattern of addiction, suggesting an increasing desensitization to violent content. The problem with this for Bundy is that that pattern also aligns with the psychopathic trait of needing constant stimulation or proneness to boredom in the presence of an unchanging stimulus. Okay, so he wants us to see him as an addict. Yet another victim archetype trotted out and yet another way in which he isn't responsible for what he became and did. Bundy's expression of feeling deeply about the impact of pornography is likely another layer of his manipulation, aimed at resonating with Dobson's concerns. His practiced manipulativeness is on full display here. How long did you stay at that point before you actually assaulted someone? Well, yeah, you see, you, that is a very delicate point in my own development. And we're talking about something, we're talking about having reached a point or a, a gray area that surrounded that point over a course of years. You don't remember years. how long that well, was? Well, I, I would say, I would say a couple of years. And what was I was dealing with there were very strong inhibitions against criminal behavior or violent behavior that had been conditioned into me, bred into me, in my environment, in my neighborhood, in my church, uh, in my school. Uh, things which said, no, this is wrong. Again, this doesn't really reflect what we've heard from others of Bundy's childhood. 
Bundy's reference to the strong inhibitions against violent behavior instilled by his environment further illustrates his effort to distance his intrinsic psychopathic tendencies from his actions. It also shows that he recognizes what he did is wrong. His acknowledgement of societal and moral constraints, yet his eventual overriding of these inhibitions, aligns with the psychopathic traits of egocentricity and lack of regard for societal norms. His acknowledgement of the impact on victims and families is likely a strategic move to appear empathetic, fitting his manipulative pattern. I mean, just I mean, even to think of it is wrong, but it'll, certainly to do it is wrong. And you're on, well, I'm on that edge, and these, the last, the, the, you might say, the last vestiges of restraint, uh, the barriers to actually doing something were being tested constantly and assault, uh, assailed um, through the kind of fantasy life that was fueled largely by pornography. Do you remember what pushed you over that edge? Do you remember well, the decision to go for it? Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to defer yes, again. I, I that, understand that. That, that I was that, 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 that I was clear. some helpless yeah. kind of a victim, and yet. Uh, uh, we're talking about an influence which, that is the influence of violent types of media and violent pornography, which had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain. Bundy's insistence that he was not a helpless victim of his influences, yet simultaneously attributing a significant role to these external influences in his behavior, is an example of an excellent manipulative tactic. Once caught, it is much more successful to admit fault and then actually lay the blame elsewhere than it is to just outright deny any responsibility whatsoever. Bundy had denied his guilt for as long as he thought it was viable and now, at the end of his life, has decided to admit it but lay the blame elsewhere as a final throw of the dice to get clemency. In a behavior, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders and what, and what have you, <laughs> it's a it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, I mean, uh, the the sensation of the the uh, of of reaching that point where you, where I knew that it, it was like something had say snapped. That I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that that I had, had been, uh, I had learned as a child, uh, that had been instilled in me, were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. This statement reflects a common narrative in psychopathy where the individual describes a snapping point. This is often used to externalize blame and deflect personal responsibility, suggesting that their actions were beyond their control. Bundy's reference to childhood barriers indicates an awareness of societal norms, but simultaneously shows a lack of true internalization of these norms, typical in psychopathic behavior. He knows and understands them, but doesn't feel or believe them. Would it be accurate to call that a, a, a frenzy, a sexual frenzy? Well, yes, that's one way to describe it, a compulsion, a... a, a building up of, of this destructive energy. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that we, I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol. But I think that, that what alcohol did, uh, in conjunction with, let's say, my exposure to pornography, was alcohol reduced my inhibitions at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the, the fantasy life that was fueled by pornography uh, eroded them further. Yes. Bundy calls it a frenzy, a compulsion. This sounds like he's detaching himself from the horror of and responsibility for his actions, doesn't it? Think about it. By blaming alcohol and pornography, Bundy cleverly shifts the focus onto external factors and not himself. In the early days, you were nearly always about half drunk when you did these things, is that right? Yes, yes. Now, was that always true? I I would say that that was 
generally the case, yeah. almost with, with, without it. All right, if I can understand it now, there's this battle going on within. There are the conventions that you've been taught. There's the right and wrong that you learned as a child. Mm -hmm. And then there is this, this uh, unbridled passion uh, fueled by uh, your plunge into hardcore violent pornography. And those things are at war with each other. Yes. And then with the uh, alcohol diminishing the, uh, the inhibitions, Right. You let go. Well, yes, and to you can summarize it that way, and that's accurate, certainly. And it it just occurred to me that some people would would say that well, I I've seen that stuff, and it doesn't do anything to me. And I can understand that. I don't, virtually everyone uh, can be exposed to so-called pornography, and while they're aroused to it to one degree or another, and not go out and do anything wrong. Well, addictions are like that. They affect some yeah. people more than they affect others. Well, but there is a percentage of people affected by hardcore pornography. Notice how Bundy leans into the idea of being intoxicated. It's like he's saying, it wasn't me, it was the alcohol. Now imagine a prohibitionist hearing this. They'd have a field day. But again, Bundy's playing the blame game. He's trying to convince us that the alcohol and so-called addiction to pornography are the real culprits. But let's not be fooled. What's really going on here? In my opinion, it is a master manipulator spinning a narrative to a well-meaning but clearly gullible man in an effort to save his own skin. In a very violent way, and you're obviously one of them. That was a major component, and I don't know why I was vulnerable to it. All I know is that... Uh... That it, uh, that it had an, an impact on me uh, that was just so uh, central to the development of the violent behavior that I engaged in. Ted, after you committed your first murder, what was the emotional effect on you? What happened in the days after that? Well, again, this Please understand that, that even all these years later, it's very difficult to talk difficult. about it, and, and, and reliving it through talking about it, uh, it is uh, difficult to say the least, but I want you to understand what happened. It was like coming out of some kind of horrible trance or, or dream. Um, I can only liken it to after, you know, I don't want to over-dramatize it, but to have been possessed by something so awful and so alien, and then the next morning wake up from it, remember what happened, and realize that basically, I mean, in, in the eyes of the law, certainly in the eyes of God, you're responsible to, have, to wake up in the morning and, and realize what I had done. And with a clear mind and all my essential moral and ethical feelings intact at that moment. Uh, uh, absolutely horrified that I was capable of doing something like that. So horrified that he took the heads home with him and assaulted the bodies repeatedly until decay and animal damage made that no longer possible. If he was so horrified, why did he keep repeating his crimes? There is a disconnect here. The pieces of his story just don't fit together when you examine them closely. You really hadn't known that before? Uh, there is just absolutely no way to describe first the brutal urge to do that kind of thing and then what happens is once it, it has been more or less satisfied and recede, you might say, or spent that, that sense, that kind of energy level recedes. And basically, I became my, myself again. I, I want people to understand this too, and I'm not saying this gratuitously, because it's important that people understand this, that basically, I was a normal person. Uh, I, I wasn't uh, some guy hanging out uh, at bars or a bum or uh, I wasn't a pervert in the sense that, you know, people look at somebody and say, I know there's something wrong with him and just tell. I mean, I, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life. 
except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret, very close to myself and didn't let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it was, it, I want yeah, to be quite candid with you. I was, I was okay, okay? Uh, I was. And the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it, it unfortunately became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. He, he snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of the, my home 20, 30 years ago. And, and as diligent as my parents were, uh, and they were diligent in protecting their children, and as good a Christian home as we had, and we had a wonderful Christian home, uh, there is no protection against the, kind that, the kinds of influences that are loose in the society that, that, that tolerates. Again, a tissue of lies. He wasn't a normal person. What he was was a murderous psychopath who had constructed a facade of normalcy to camouflage the real him. Here he is pretending the facade was the real him. That's simply not true. You feel this really deeply, don't you? Ted, outside these walls right now, there are several hundred reporters that wanted to talk to you. Yeah. And you asked me to come here from California because you had something you wanted to say. This hour that we have together is not just an interview with a man who's scheduled to die tomorrow morning. You feel this really deeply, don't you? No, no, he doesn't. I can absolutely guarantee you that as a man who scored 39 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist, he absolutely does not feel this deeply. This is just James Dobson seeing what he wants to see as Bundy bet he would. Score one point for Bundy's psychopathic and expert manipulativeness. And another one for some pretty good acting while Dobson is talking. I am here and you are here because of this message that you're talking about right here. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> But I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception. No, Ted, you're a serial killer of young women who is looking to get out of being executed. And you'll do and say anything to get out of being executed. This includes trying to negotiate for your life in return for giving up the details of where your victims' bodies were. And while you engaged in those negotiations, you also said you were motivated by a desire to provide closure to the families. But if that were true, then you'd just have given up the details to the families. And in reality, you didn't, because it wasn't about the families or closure. It was about saving your own skin deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. There's no question about it. The FBI's own study on serial homicide shows that the most common interest among serial killers is pornography. Yeah, that's true. And it's, and it's real. It's true. Wow. An FBI study back up Bundy's claim. That's really convincing. Except that he's misrepresenting the study and that isn't what it actually showed. 
but it sure sounded like a good line, and as we see, Dobson swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. Ted, what would your life have been like without that influence? You can only speculate. Yeah. Well, I, I know it would have been far better, not just for me, and, and it's, uh, excuse me for being so self-centered here, it would have been a lot better for me and lots of other people. I know that. Lots of other innocent people, victims and families. It would have been a lot better. There's no question, but it, it would have been a, a, a fuller life. Uh, certainly a life that would not have involved, I'm absolutely certain, would not have evolved, involved this kind of violence that I have been, that I have committed. Again, he is deflecting responsibility for his actions, painting a picture of a Ted Bundy who never saw intimate imagery, who would have been pious and lovely. His acknowledgement of the impact on victims and families is designed to appear as a sign of empathy. But given the context and his psychopathic traits, it is more about creating a certain image and narrative which he believes will be favorable to him. I'm uh, sure, Ted, if, uh, you know, if I were able to ask you the questions that are being asked out there, in, uh, one of the most important as you come down to perhaps your final hours, are you thinking about all those victims out there and their families well, who are so wounded, you know, years later, their lives have not returned to normal. They will never return to normal. Absolutely. Are, are you carrying that load, that weight? Is the remorse there? Again, I, I know that people will accuse me of being self-serving, but we're beyond that now. I mean, I'm just telling you how I feel. But through God's help, I have been able to come to the point where I've... Much too late, but ne better late than never, feel the hurt and the pain that I am responsible for. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure Dobson viewed Bundy's claim of remorse and acknowledging the pain he caused as significant. And I'm sure he would have appreciated Bundy's statement that it was with God's help he was somewhat healed. However, given his psychopathic profile, this expression of remorse must be viewed skeptically. It just seems very rehearsed to me. Psychopaths are known for their lack of genuine empathy and remorse, and such statements are far more likely to be part of his manipulations to receive commutation of his sentence. In the past few days, myself and a number of investigators have been talking about unsolved cases, murders that I was involved in. And it's hard to, it's hard to talk about all these years later because it revives in me all those terrible feelings and those thoughts that I have steadfastly and, 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 and diligently dealt with, and I think successfully, with the love of God. And yet it's reopened that and I felt the pain and I felt the horror again of all that. And I can only hope that those who I have harmed and those who I've caused so much grief, even if they don't believe my expression of sorrow and remorse, will believe what I'm saying now. Again, I think Bundy is being honest, just not in the manner he wishes us to believe. He does want people to believe what I'm saying now, but as a psychopath with a 39 out of 40 score on the psychopathy test, it is simply unbelievable that he feels all the sorrow and remorse he claims. His mind simply doesn't work that way. He wants you to think it does so you can identify with him, feel empathy for him, and want to pardon him, but he doesn't have that empathy within himself at all. And again, we have the references to God because his interviewer is religious. That there is loose in their towns and their communities, people like me today, whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. And what scares me, and let's come into the present now, because what I'm talking about happened 30, 20, 30 years ago, that is, in my formative stages, 
And what scares and appalls me, Dr. Dobson, is when I see what's on cable TV, <laughs> some of the movies, I mean, some of the violets in the movies are, that come into homes today with stuff that they, that they wouldn't show in X-rated adult theaters 30 years ago. This stuff. The slasher is, movies that you're talking about. That stuff <clears throat> is, I'm telling you, from personal experience, the most, that is graphic violence on screen, particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. There are kids sitting out there switching the TV dial around and come upon these movies late at night or I don't know when they're on, but they're on and any kid can watch them. It's scary when I think what would have happened to me if I had seen, I mean, scary enough. I mean, that I just ran into stuff outside the home, but to, to, be, to, to know that children are watching that kind of thing today or can pick up their phone and dial away for it or send away for it, uh, particularly as it gets into the home yeah. to children who may be unattended or, or unaware that they may be a Ted Bundy who has that, that vulnerability to that, that predisposition to be influenced by that kind of behavior, by that kind of, of, of uh, movie, that kind of violence. Oh, yes. Won't someone think of the children? It's really interesting to see his manipulation at work. As I see it, he had three main strands to his attempts to receive commutation. Firstly, negotiating with the authorities to reveal further details of his crimes and where the bodies were buried in return for commuting his death sentence. Secondly, appealing to Dobson's religiosity through claiming that he has found God and been changed through this revelation, a claim which he could reasonably expect to motivate Dobson or others to seek a stay on his death sentence. Thirdly, suggesting that he may be able to provide insight into the how exposure to intimate imagery turned him into a serial killer, and by helping understand this, he may save lives in future. It's the mind hunter defense. As a psychopath, none of these rationales are believable. Instead, it is much more believable that these are all placed to externalize blame, avoid responsibility, and avoid the death penalty. Can you help me understand this desensitization process that took place? Uh, what was going on in your mind? Well, by desensitization, I uh, describe it in specific terms, is that the, each time I'd harm someone, each time I'd kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, uh, especially at first, uh, enormous amount of, of, of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards. But then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Bundy's description of desensitization reflects a common phenomenon in serial crimes where initial emotional responses to violence diminish over time. This increasing detachment aligns with psychopathic traits of lacking empathy and remorse. However, Bundy's claim of experiencing horror, guilt, remorse is atypical for psychopathy, where such emotions are usually shallow or non-existent. If we are to believe his horror, guilt, and remorse, how do we explain that he didn't provide a full detailing of his crimes and where he left the bodies? The most logical conclusion, given what we know about Bundy, is that he didn't have any horror, guilt, and remorse, but was just saying what he felt gave him the best chance of surviving. Now, believe me, I didn't... It, it, the unique thing about how this worked, Dr. Dobson, is that I still felt in my regular life, the full range of, of guilt and, and uh, remorse about other things, uh, regret and... Uh, but you had this compartmentalized... This compartmentalized, very well focused, uh, 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 very sharply focused area where I, it was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack. And everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. Does that make sense? Hmm, you can take this one of two ways. Firstly, that Bundy is being dishonest and didn't experience a compartmentalization of empathy, guilt, regret, and remorse, but instead is saying that because it fits his narrative, or secondly, that Bundy, despite scoring 39 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist, somehow felt normal human empathy in all aspects of his life, except that aspect which encompassed his mistreatment of and killing of women. That simply isn't believable or keeping with the details of what he did to them both pre and post-mortem. Yeah, it does. Uh, 
One of the, the final murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? Where, was there, were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I, uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's the reason. That's too painful. I would like to, uh, I'd like to be able to convey to you what that, that, uh, that experience is like, but I can't, uh, I won't okay. be able to talk about that. Okay. I can't begin to understand. Well, I can try, but I'm, I'm aware that I can't begin to understand the pain that the parents of these, of these children that I have, and these young women that I have harmed feel. And I can't restore really much to them, if anything. I will pretend to, and I don't even expect them to forgive me, and I'm not asking for it. The, that kind of forgiveness is of God, and if they have it, they have it. If they don't, well, maybe they'll find it someday. Do you deserve the punishment the state has inflicted upon you? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'll answer it very, very honestly. I, I don't want to die. I'm not going to kid you. I'll kid, kid you not. Um, I deserve certainly the, the most extreme punishment society has. And I deserve, I think society deserves to be protected from me and from others like me, that's for sure. Uh, I think what I, what I hope will come of our discussion is I think society deserves to be protected from itself because, because as, we, as, as we've been talking, there are, there are forces that loosen in, in in this country, particularly, again, uh, this kind of violent uh, pornography, uh, where, on the one hand, well-meaning, decent people will condemn behavior of a Ted Bundy while they're walking past a, a, a magazine rack full of the very kinds of things that send young kids down the road to be Ted Bundy's. Bundy's response to the question of deserving punishment is multifaceted. On one hand, he acknowledges deserving the most extreme punishment and recognizes the need for society to be protected from him, which might seem like an acceptance of responsibility. However, he quickly shifts the focus to society needing protection from itself, particularly from violent pornography. This shift can be seen as a continuation of his narrative that external factors, rather than his own psychopathic traits, are to blame for his actions. His focus on societal hypocrisy also diverts attention from his own guilt and is a manipulative tactic typical of psychopathic behavior. I believe his reference to divine forgiveness can be seen as an appeal to Dobson's religious or moral sensibilities and is another manipulative strategy. That's the irony. We're talking here not just about more. We're talking, I'm, what I'm talking about is going beyond retribution, which is mm. what people want with me, going beyond retribution and punishment, because there is no way in the world that killing me is going to restore uh, those beautiful children to their parents and, and, and correct and, 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 and soothe the pain. But I'll tell you, there are lots of other kids playing in streets around this country today who, who are going to be dead tomorrow and the next day and the next day and next month because other young people are reading the kinds of things and seeing the kinds of things that are available in the media today. Bundy is suggesting that his execution won't solve the underlying problems he evinces to believe contributed to violent behavior. His narrative seems to be that killing him won't restore the children, so there's no point killing him. Instead, society should focus on the intimate imagery which is busy creating the next generation of serial killers. Ted, as you would imagine, there is tremendous cynicism about you on the outside, and I suppose for good reason. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'm not sure that there's anything that you could say that people would uh, would believe. Some people would believe. Yeah. And uh, and yet, you told me last night, and I have heard this through our mutual friend John Tanner, that you have uh, accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and uh, are a follower and a believer in Him. Do you draw strength from that uh, as you approach these final hours? I do. I can't say that uh, it's going to be being easy. in the, the the valley of the shadow of death is is something that I've become all that accustomed to, and that I you know, and that I'm strong and uh, uh, nothing bothering me. Uh, listen, it's no fun. It's mm -hmm. it's it, you know it's it's uh, it's gets kind of lonely, and yet I have to remind myself that every one of us. Uh, will go through this someday you know, in one way or another and, 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 man. and countless so uh, millions who have walked this earth before us have so this is just an experience which we all share and yeah here I am Bundy's expression of religious belief and acceptance of forgiveness can be interpreted in different ways on one hand it could represent a genuine turning point in his life an acceptance of a higher power and a search for redemption however Considering Bundy's psychopathic traits, particularly manipulative behavior, this is unlikely and is just another attempt to cast himself in a favorable light. In the shadow of Ted Bundy's execution, our exploration of his final interview offers a haunting glimpse into manipulation and psychopathy. His last days weren't just marked by reflection, but also by a frantic scramble for clemency. Despite efforts by his attorney and some supporters to sway opinion, including pleas to the families of the victims and plea to Governor Bob Martinez. Their attempts were starkly rebuffed. The families refused his pleas and Governor Martinez declared, we are not going to have the system manipulated. For him to be negotiating for his life over the bodies of victims is despicable. A grave reminder of the reality behind Bundy's machinations. In closing, our journey through Ted Bundy's final interview paints a haunting picture of manipulation and psychopathy. It's crucial to remember the real victims of Bundy's crimes, the lives tragically cut short and families forever altered. Their genuine suffering stands in stark contrast to Bundy's feigned victimhood. Having heard Bundy's final words and our analysis, what are your thoughts on how society should deal with such manipulative individuals? Do you think we are currently equipped to identify and prevent potential dangers posed by individuals like Bundy? What are your thoughts about his final interview? Join the conversation and help us dissect these complex criminal minds here on Crime and Psychiatry. If you'd like to learn more about psychopaths, serial killers, and criminal psychology, please check out our channel and the other videos there. And don't forget to click the like, subscribe, and notifications button in order to be notified when our next video is released.